Hey folks, good morning everyone. Gonna give everyone about another minute, uh, maybe two, to enter the room. And then we'll get started with our webinar this morning. I have a really good one for you. Uh, Mike Marsick with South Face, a ventilation guru. Uh, uh, right? Uh, that's your, your title. That's on your business card, right, Mike? I, I, don't, I don't know about I don't know that the guru gets used a lot, but with my <laughs> name. But anyway, um, can you see my screen? That was one thing I was going to ask. Are you seeing my title slide there? Applied Building Science Ventilation Part One. Yes, yep. sir. And if I yep. advance it, you're seeing that. Good. Everything yes, sir. Looks yes. Like and, it's and anywhere you, if you need to point out something on a slide, just move your cursor, and we can you see where, it. wherever your cursor goes, and we're good to go. Uh, what time it. is it? It's nine thirty on the dot. Let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. This is Jason Vandiver, Energy Code Program Manager for SPEAR. Uh, SPEAR is an energy efficiency nonprofit serving, serving Texas and Oklahoma. Uh, any way I can help help you out, if it's energy code related, or, or frankly, as a recovering building official, any kind of construction code related. Uh, I'm a bit of a code nerd and, and happy to do what I can. And what I can't do I turn on folks that I meet at some of these great conferences and some of these other webinars that I catch. Um, and we have one of those folks with us today, Mike Barsic with South Face. I I'm going to go ahead and let you introduce yourself, Mike. Tell us all about yourself, and then the, the, the floor is yours. Go ahead and get started. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, everybody. Hope you all can hear me and I uh, hope you're having a good day today. And thanks for accommodating my schedule to a little bit probably earlier than you normally do. Um, I uh, come at the world from the mechanical engineering side of things, and I work for a nonprofit also called South Face. We're based in Atlanta, and I'm going to be using slides from a presentation that a colleague of mine did, a colleague of mine and I did uh, just a couple weeks ago, um, where we covered this very topic in two different webinars. So I'm going to try to kind of pick a few choice slides on this first one and then uh, jump over to the second one, which I think has more sort of meat and potatoes about ventilation. Um, <clears throat> like I said, uh, you know, I have an engineering background, but I have a lot of construction experience and I um, have built a lot of houses and renovated houses and I live in an old house and uh, my wife is an architect. We met building houses. So we, we just eat and drink and breathe this building science stuff. We love it. Um, and, uh, uh, that's a that's a picture of me um, pre-COVID. There's a picture of me with my house. Uh, I've, it's a it's actually a hundred year old house here, and a lot of energy improvements on it uh, in the 20 years that we've lived in it. Um, our first winter that we lived in it, we're, I'm I'm based here in Atlanta. We used um, about 575 therms of gas to heat it, and the last I don't know eight winters or so, it's been less than 200. So that, that shows you we've been making some good improvements. And I've done a lot of stuff to get my electrical bills low. Um, they were running about $1,000 for the year. Um, and then about <clears throat> three years ago, we put solar panels on them. So that's a picture of our solar panels. We have a, a 4,000 4KW array. It's about 15 panels. And it's just going like crazy. So it's been really terrific. And that knocked our bill. Last year, it was like 440 bucks. So um, you know, solar, we'll talk that another time. Um, and uh, like everybody, um, I'm guessing, I say like everybody, I'm guessing a lot of people on this call started out looking like that, but then by now you look more like this. This is what I look like today. So that that's gives you a sense of that. Um, and uh, Jason, if you can hear me, if, if people have questions or something and they want to type them in, if you'll be the filter of that and feel free to interrupt as we go, that's fine. Yeah, okay. Um, I also want to invite y'all. Yeah, yeah, I have questions. Um, I also want to invite y'all if you're interested. We have been doing a series of, they have been weekly building science webinars. And <clears throat> the first three were kind of on the concepts of heat, air, and moisture. They're one hour. We try to make them fun. And, and uh, they're all recorded. And I think you can get to them on our website. Then we did one on insulation. Oops, I'm sorry. Insulation grading. Or, and install correctly. And we did, we did uh, one last week about condition crawl spaces. And then we did one yesterday, abducted mechanicals. And then one next Thursday is on high performance insulated roof lines. I think for June, we're going to have to go back to one a month, but we hope to keep it going. We had 176 people yesterday, so that was great. 
So anyway, um, we try to, my organization really tries to do a lot of education. I've been involved with uh, teaching hers and code and energy codes I mean, for many, many years. Um, I actually taught the first, oh, I don't know, six or eight hers trainings in Texas uh, in the early 2000s. And I should mention my wife is an Aggie. I don't know if that's good or bad to you. So you can uh, weigh in with the comments on that one. So um, nah, that's but, bad. I'm a Red Raider. Yeah, I can tech. No, that's, that's, you know, uh, that's a, I don't, I'm from, I went to Georgia Tech. So that's a whole nother, you know, that's a whole nother world of pain. Um, and uh, <laughs> my comment about Oklahoma was uh, five years ago, my family and I were driving around the country and we stopped in Oklahoma. And we had the windiest picnic that we've ever had. So we were very impressed with all the wind turbines and, and what y'all are doing out there is pretty impressive. So um, well, my organization, again, based in Atlanta, we do a lot of training and uh, we're really trying to do push more of that online these days. So um, check out our website. There's also a lot of good content. There's the website. And we've done recently, Georgia just went to a brand new energy code. And um, at this uh, website, you can go to the resources tab. Maybe I'll, well, I don't want to over pitch it. But anyway, um, even though it says Georgia, there's a really good pictorial guide for how to use the energy code. Lots and lots of pictures, lots and lots of explanation, very little code speak. Um, and other things are there. This is one I particularly want to point out is there's about a 10 page white paper on. Uh, how to do ventilation strategies, um, at, which we're going to talk about a lot of those today, but that's a really good little summary that you might find useful. So you can get all this from the southface.org website. It's all good stuff there. There's also some videos and webinars on various topics of the energy code that you may find useful, and uh, hopefully that'll help you out. Um, I'm going to skip on, bear with me, I got to get through some slides that we cover the basics of heat, air, moisture, uh, with air. Um, movement. It's, it's probably good to review that real quick. A couple rules on air movement. Air always moves from high pressure to low pressure and the amount of air that leaks in is always equal to the amount of air that leaks out and vice versa. And there's three things that cause pressure differences in homes. The wind, of course, the warm air rising effect and cold air falling effect. That's the stack effect and of course fans. So those are the three things that cause air movement. They're just some good things to remember about ventilation. Um, I'm a question list. If anybody on here, Jason, can answer this. Who said the air is so unwholesome air in a closed room that's been often breathed and not changed? All right, mm -hmm. Jason, let's see if anybody is awake and is Googling the answer or something. I'm gonna give you a hint, this was about uh, this was a good while ago, the person that said this. Okay, famous American. Anybody? And there's, chat it in, folks. You can hit yeah, it on the chat that. or type Afraid it in the Q&A. This, this is where you got to test your trivia knowledge. Well, okay, I'm going to go ahead and answer it. The answer is uh, Ben Franklin, which is, I think, oh. is pretty impressive. I think David I Mitchell know. came in with the right answer right before Well he done. Came. Now, did he that Google meant, it? Well, I don't know. I don't know. That's okay. The Google's allowed, but good job. Good answer. Um, pretty impressive. Very astute. Um, he was, he was kind of on it. So um, the big picture here, and I, like I said, this first module, I'm going to go pretty fast through it, but I do want to give you a little context on ventilation and how it fits into uh, indoor air quality. And then um, uh, talk about Physical stuff and get into there's two standards that you need to be aware of one if you're just looking at code um, and if you do beyond code stuff you might want to be aware of the other one and then um, and then the second part I'm going to try to cover how to do it so um, this is all important houses a system can you build a house too tight you know it's kind of semantics we would say no you can't build a house too tight as long as you put in fresh air so you know that that, that the house is too tight that's not possible as long as you put it in fresh air. So that's what we're trying to achieve. And I, you know, my house, when I moved into it, was ridiculously leaky. It was 30 something air changes uh, with a blower door. Um, and so by code, people would say, oh, you don't need a, a ventilation. But honestly, I have allergies and I was breathing a lot of air from my vented moldy crawl space. And I was also getting air from my, you know, dusty attic. And even our outdoor air is not always perfectly clean. It has pollen in it, and 
other stuff. We do not have an attached garage, but those are big issues with uh, a pollutant entry pathway. So leaky house does not equal good air, air quality. That's probably the big way. And our definition of defined vent is this is provided for people uh, intentionally. And, and, it's, and we're not talking about attic venting or cross garage venting. And it's, it's going to contrast with air leakage, infiltration, which is kind of random stuff occurring in random amounts and, uh, and you know, different unknown locations. So that's kind of what we're talking about when we say the differentiation between air leakage and ventilation. I think this is just an example of a hole I found in my attic most recently. I'm going to do some home improvement. And we always have to challenge people after all these hours to get people to do something on, to make your your home more efficient or help somebody else. This was a, a home a hole I found where a ceiling had been 10 foot and it had been brought down to eight foot and they just had thrown a piece of a drywall on top of it and covered it with insulation. So I like to seal holes using duct mastic and I, I put the mastic on the perimeter of it like you see here and then I kind of squished a foam board down into it. I cut foam board by the way you can get a really good if you cut it on a table saw or a skill saw. Um, so I cut it and it fits nice and tight I squished it in and then I went around the edges with mastic. And then uh, that's what it looked like. Put some insulation on it, covered it all up. Boom, boom, boom. I also have been in a project and my daughter there has been helping me. We've been putting radiant barrier up in my attic. So um, that's, been a, that's been a hot job, but actually we took advantage of a beautiful spring and we pretty much got it done, so that was great. Um, can we let the house just breathe? And again, I think we made a pitch about if you don't let, if you don't put in intentional air, any air changes you get are coming from unknown spaces and, and unknown amounts and not on a regular basis. Can you open windows? Yes, you can. <laughs> but there's issues with security and dust and pollen and humidity and pests and noise. And, um, and it requires an active homeowner, which some people just aren't into that. And, and uh, we definitely need fresh air on a very regular basis. So um, yes, you can use windows. It's very easy to make a tight house leaky. You just open a window. It's very hard to make a leaky house tight, but that's what we do in the weatherization world. So uh, a couple of things. I'm going fast here, but this is important. So appreciate that what we're trying to achieve is good indoor air quality and ventilation is only a part of that. And also appreciate that people have the biggest impact on indoor air quality. Um, our basic goals, keep the home dry, keep it free of mold, dry it as needed. Um, and in some places you may want to humidify as needed. Most of my work is in the uh, mixed humid climate. So we're usually less worried about being too dry, but it is a factor and, and you'll see in a minute why. Um, it, try not to do stupid stuff in your house. You know, do things that are just going to emit la massive amounts of pollutants. And if you got to do things that are going to do massive amounts of pollutants, that's a good time to be opening the windows and running ventilation. Um, use good ventilation. It's baths in particular, but by code, um, ducted to the outside. Don't do real stupid things. Don't use combustion air that's the same air people breathe, and don't ever burn something without a flue pipe. So, you know, just, we gotta be smart about this, especially as houses get tighter. This, this is just, we gotta, we gotta make good decisions. Um, and take advantage of natural ventilation when you can. Open up the windows and, and get fresh air when you can and, and shut off the system. And, um, you know, I, I was gonna say, it, it took me a long time. I had, like, they went, I went through a lot of dog treats trying to get a picture of my dogs going, one of my wiener dogs going in and out of this door. So I hope you appreciate that effort. Um, you want to obviously have a tight house because a tight house helps you control where the air comes from. And you also want to have tight duct work. I think that goes without saying. And, and it allows you to, if the outdoor conditions are not good, it allows us to seal that off. Um, there are certain things we can test for. Radon is a good example. You want to use variable speed equipment. I cannot emphasize that enough from the HVAC side, variable speed at a minimum an EC motor. And we want to use a deeper, thicker pleated filter. That's the filter that we're going to push for. Okay, I'm going to try to go fast, but we have pollutants from a lot of indoor sources um, and biological and chemicals and off gassing from aldehydes and, and even pollutants outdoors 
um, emissions and uh, tail emissions and ground level of ozone and smog and humidity even is a pollutant. So being aware of that, um, again, I think we've emphasized this. So in the hierarchy, just want to, we're going to move on here, but in the hierarchy, the goal is to eliminate pollutants. That's the best thing you can do or separate them so they don't get to the people. And then the third thing on the list is to flush them out or dilute them with fresher air. Usually the outdoor air is cleaner than indoor. And so uh, it's not always, but usually it is. So flushing out pollutants is a strategy, but it's never as good as actually getting rid of the thing that's off gassing. And then of course, fourth on the list is catching in a filter. Um, so here's just a couple examples of pollutant source just choosing the right finishes, things that aren't an off gas, making good sort of material decision and, and not choosing, or if you have an unvented space heater, getting rid of it, that kind of thing. Um, uh, pollutant separation is where you got it, but it can't get to your lungs. And an example would be like, you know, put a job of air sealing the house to garage connections, um, run an exhaust fan that keeps the garage under negative pressure, you know, sealing, uh, if you have a particle of a type of glue that often has a urea formaldehyde, it's not good for humans. Sometimes you can steal that. If you have to have it, you can still steal it. Um, even like you buy new furniture, you let it sort of off gas before you bring it in. Um, and and your uh, I think cover this. So all combustion, this is Mike's rule intelligent combustion, you always have a flue pipe and make sure you have separate combustion air and ideally separate from the people air. And these products violate both of those. Um, that's a filter that we recommend you change it every, every summer Olympics, change your filter. So um, one inch filter is really not there to help you. Even the better quality ones, it's just there for the equipment. Um, so we're a big advocate of a thicker, deeper pleated filter. Um, and and okay, if you can get to say a four or five to six inch thick, deep filter, a lot of pleats on it, you're getting up into this MERV 11, MERV 13 range. MERV 13 can catch virus. Um, so there's a lot to be said for better filtration and we got to in, in, intelligently design filters. I really like this concept, anybody, and I know Texas and probably Oklahoma, you all have a lot of these in new home, these filter grills. Here's a company that makes an aftermarket filter. You actually can put a five inch filter, and I think it's MERV 13, in a one inch filter grill. It goes inside the wall cavity. It's got, it's a really clever idea. It's called Practical Pleat. Um, April Air has something kind of similar to that too. If, um, you know, this is also just saying, make sure filter is accessible and don't have leakage around your filter access. You can make one of these with refrigerator magnets and a piece of plastic, or you can buy one for 10 bucks. Um, so make sure your filter, your duct system is tight. Okay, I'm going fast. Um, okay, I'm gonna skip through this and just kind of say, what do we, well, I'm, I'm gonna go, apologies for all this. I'm gonna send you all these slides. Uh, most of these bath fans and exhaust devices that we put in are going to pull us under negative pressure. We can take a hit of negative pressure for a, you know, period of time. If you're in a humid climate in particular, I'm not a fan of exhaust only as your whole house strategy. And I, I'm not a fan of that anywhere, but I think other drier climates can maybe pull it off. Um, and a lot of times too, I want to make sure we get enough runtime on bath fans. So this is what I retrofitted on. My kids, you know, weren't just get, they weren't running the fan enough. So I put it, the light on the, the light and the fan are on a, a timer switch. It's preset 10, 20, 40, 60 minutes. So you can always override it, but in general, people come in, hit the light on, hit the fan, and the fan will run for a good chunk of time. So just to make sure you get enough runtime. Pick up air, it's own ammo. Got it. Boo, boo, boo. I'm just trying to get to, uh, this is the old study. Um, the new, um, the new, I say new, relatively new um, in early 2000s up through 2010, there's an ASHRAE 62.2 ventilation standard. And this is the fairly famous equation. 
which is seven and a half CFM per person plus one CFM per hundreds, every hundred square feet of conditioned uh, space. And I'll, <clears throat> more recently, beginning in the 13, the 16, and the 19, the big difference here is that they've kept that uh, CFM per person, but they've added, that they've gone from instead of one to three CFM per hundred square feet. And the reason is because back in the early 2000s, they were just assuming that there was gonna be a certain amount of leakage on the house. And under the new code, we're assuming that the house is pretty tight, but they do give you the option of backing this number down if you do a blower door test. And I'll, I'll show you that real quick. Um, and that's the equation that says, you, whatever that number is, you can reduce it because you can show your house is not, not super tight. Um, it's kind of a different strategy. So I'm gonna skip this part and just, okay, so 62, 20, take an example, or, or, or let, let me say that they came up with this equation and the equation is based on the floor area, 1% of the floor area and number of people. And we estimate number of people from bedrooms plus one. So a three bedroom house is gonna have four people, four times seven and a half, that's 30. And then you put one for every you know, um, 100 square feet. Uh, and it's also, they also made a chart and the chart tends to round up. Um, so I'll work an example and show you. So here's a 1300 square foot small house, three bedrooms, four people, 30 CFM, and it's uh, 1300 square feet. So we'll add another 13 and you'll see it gets to 43 CFM. So that's the answer if you use the equation. <clears throat> if you use the chart, you'll see it rounds up slightly to 45 in this example. Um, so 45 CFM if you go by the chart. And if you have a big house, so here's a large house, um, it's got five bedrooms, so that's six people, so that's 45 CFM, but it's a 5,200 square foot house. So you're gonna put that in there. So now we're up to about 100 CFM. If you use the, equa uh, the chart over here, at about, uh, kind of give you a sense of how it all works. Um, and it be, um, you know, so the small house is around 45 CFM, the big house is around 100 CFM. And um, before we go into the other one, I'm going to go ahead and say this, and I'll sure slides will pop up in a minute. The code is based on the 2010 version of the standard. So that's what the code today is based on. And that was in the 2012 IRC, in the 2015 IRC and in the 2018 IRC. Um, so I just wanna be clear about that. In the meantime, the ASHRAE standard went a different direction um, and in the, in the, from the 13 onwards, it went to this formula, which is bigger. Um, and and uh, so I'll give you an example. So here's a three bedroom, 1300 square foot house, that same small house. So instead of 43 CFM, we've got a much bigger contribution. So now close to 70 CFM. And if we do over here with the chart, we are at 75 CFM. So that's a lot more ventilation, um, but you'll see there, you can do an adjustment on that. I'll show you that in a second. For the big house, uh, 200 CFM or, you know, about 200 CFM. So definitely increased the amount of ventilation. Um, by the way, before I explain the, the adjustments, um, the code, again, is based on the 2010 version, and the code and the standards all say, if you're supposed to do 45 continuous, you can elect to do double that for half the time or triple that for a third of the time. So, for example, you could make your ventilation run 20 minutes every hour, and you could do, uh, what's three times 45, 135 CFM during that run time. So that, that's what the code allows you to do, and so does the standard, it, what's called intermittent. Um, and one says you gotta do the equivalent ventilation every four hours, and the, the newer one says you gotta do it every three hours. Um, so I think we've covered that. And I think I've made this case again, that this is all based on uh, the 2010 standard. It uses the same table. And it basically says, if you're less than five ACH 50 on a blower door test, which I'm guessing most new homes are gonna hit that, then you have to put in uh, a ventilation system. And so the, by code, virtually everywhere in the country is gonna be below five. Um, let's see. 
So again, it takes the table, uh, but in 2018 IRC, they give you the table or the formula. So no changes there. Um, one of the big change difference between the standard and the, um, the, the standard and the actual code is that the code doesn't make you prove it. The code just says, yeah, make it uh, design a system that'll bring in the right CFM, but the, you know, doesn't actually, you know, prove that it works. So that's a big difference between when you go by the standard. And of course, both the code and the standard, I just want to reemphasize, require the kitchens and baths to, generally what you see is 100 CFM ducted to the outside for kitchen, 50 CFM for bath. Um, so I think, so I, just, I wanted to work an example just to show you um, by the code um, and by the new standard, uh, this is a, for whatever reason, a 1400 square foot house. So by code, it would be 45, 44 CFM. By the new standard, it'd be 72 CFM. But the new standard allows you to do some adjustments to it. And for example, this house that would have required 72 CFM by the new standard, if I did a blower door test and I had a five ACH 50, I would get some credit on infiltration. Uh, for, for That was my original number, 72 CFM. And it would reduce when I got credit for infiltration because it's five ACH 50, it reduces back down to almost the same number as the other standard. So it's kind of like saying with this newer ASHRAE standard, which by the way, the HERS industry uses a version of this. What they're saying is we're assuming your house is tight, but if you prove that it's leaky, you can use a calculator tool and reduce the amount of ventilation. Most people use a red dynamics calculator tool. Um, if you want, we have a free version that's a spreadsheet, but I'd probably say use red. And uh, that's about it. Uh, I think that's a, enough. Um, so yeah, um, if you'll kind of ignore, this was a very old standard, just to kind of look at it. Here's a comparison for the small house under the code today and under the newer standard before you make adjustments. And likewise for the really big house under the code today it would be about 100 CFM. And by this newer standard before adjustments, it'd be 200 CFM. So those are, you know, those are kind of the ranges that we're looking for. And that's my summary of what we're talking about right there. So um, let me, how am I doing on time, Jason? I think I got a good half hour. Uh, uh, yes, you do have a, a, a solid half hour. Great. But if um, you finish a little early, don't, I mean, no, no big deal. You just go at your own pace. And if we run a little long or finish a little early, that'll be fine. Okay. So I'm going to jump over to uh, uh, and I apologize, I went through that real fast. I'm going to jump over to my other presentation. And uh, let me kind of get into it here. It, it as you're like, swapping over, uh, if, if you want, Mike, go ahead and address. And that, that's the first thing. I'm glad somebody asked it because that's the first thing I thought of is, can you, can you briefly discuss, I mean, you can't just go slapping in a five-inch filter where a system was designed for the static of a one-inch. You want to talk just briefly? Well, well. That that's you're right because generally you think a thicker pleated filter is going to have more pressure drop, and mm -hmm. um, that's a good one to pull up right here if y'all can see this. Um, yeah, um, I call can't. it thicker, but I got some feedback. The one of the April Air guys, a friend of mine, he says, "You know, we like to call them deep filters," and um, and I get where he's coming from. But what you actually find is that. A, a deeper pleated filter, if you were to open it, you could stretch it across the room. It's got, you know, uh, 25 square feet of surface area. So um, a lot of times those deeper pleated filters actually have less pressure drop. Um, but you're absolutely right, you have to pay attention to it. And that's why I say get away from one inch because one inch filters no have pressure drop uh, and, and the the, the deeper pleated filters, I think generally, um, if you, you, need to, you need to do the math, check it out, but you're right. But they actually, a lot of times, have a, they, they have a less pressure drop and they load obviously over time. Filters actually work better as they get dirtier, all filters do. But there's a penalty, of course, when they get too much pressure drop across them. The deeper pleated filters have so much surface area that the effective um, life of them can be six months to a year. So 
good question. I totally understand. Um, one through more ceiling. This is just talking about uh, if you've got an existing home and you're willing to make a little hole, you can stick a camera up in it, take a picture, and see if you've got this blocking right here. So anyway, this kind of blocking what we're looking for. Uh, anyway, I'm going to drive on and say get into it. So here's our summary slide. Again, the two main equations. What we really want to focus on is how do we do this. Um, and so here's your basic strategies. You can suck air out of a house. You can push air into a house, or you can do both at the same time and end up with a balanced airflow. Okay. And the easiest, cheapest one is to just run a bath fan all the time. It, if it's a, a, a quiet, efficient fan, it's usually an Energy Star fan, and that will satisfy code. And um, our only recommendation is just you know make sure you're getting one that's actually going to be able to move. If you if you need a certain amount of CFM, you know make sure it's actually going to be able to deliver that. So um, a lot has to do with how it's ducted. So we generally say look for the amount of CFM of the fan, not at 0.1 inches of water column. That's very unrealistic. Look at it at, at about 0.25 inches of water column. Um, and that is probably more realistic with what you can see with ducts, with ducting. So on the positive side, this is cheap to buy and it's cheap to run um, and it's pretty efficient. Uh, but on the negative side, there's a big negative. We don't know where it comes from. We know where it but we don't know where it comes in. And we have no way we have no way of filtering it, and we have no way of knowing that it's really uh, being distributed uh, around the house. So um, that's my big thing. And uh, I took this picture of the. I've seen this picture in every state I've been to. Um, this is an, a commercial example, but it's an example of a water stuck spot on a dropling tile. And I bet most of you have figured out that is not caused by a roof leak that is caused by infiltration. So when you put a building under negative pressure and you live in Austin, Texas, like this picture, you're very likely gonna pull in humidity and see condensation. So that is my issue. It works the same way in a house. Also, um, this, I don't know if y'all see this kind of ridiculous ducting, but you know the, the amount of pressure drop that this piece of flex duct adds is ridiculous. And you're like, no one would ever design We lost Mike. Our Mike, you went mute. There we go. I'm, I did. Oh, that, I, we're, I you're apologize. Good. Oh, no worries. Go ahead. All right. So, guys, um, we're not seeing your screen uh, anymore either. If you want to okay. share the screen again, Ian. Yeah, that's that's what it is. Yeah, thank you. Let me no share my screen. And... Uh, a quick question that came in while while you're yeah. swapping over, um, Ken, and I don't even. This is a new one. I, I, morning, Valerie. I'm happy to see you on. She asked, "Can you use bipolar and reduce outside air?" I'm not even familiar. With um, yeah, uh, and actually, we've we've used that on commercial projects, and we've um, generally had pretty good results with that. Um, and the, the idea is you got a device that the air flows, it's, it's more, I, I, I don't think we've used it in houses, but we use it on a number of commercial buildings. And, you know, like for example, um, the Salvation Army loves us because we've really helped them save a lot of energy. And they, mm -hmm. had, a, um, they had a shelter that they had, they had statistical data on, on all the, you know, the influenza cases. This is year, not currently, but on the old influenza cases. And, um, they retrofitted that and they found a significant drop in the cases of, you know, people getting uh, the flu and spreading it, that kind of thing. Um, so uh, what it, what the way it works is air flows past a device that kind of ionizes it or something and it. It puts a charge on the partic particulates in it and they um, are much more likely to cling to the filter surface now. So it's just a sort of way of turbocharging a filter. That's my very crude definition of how it works. But yes, we have had success with that. Um, and it is a way to theoretically reduce, um, at ASHRAE 62.1, which is commercial buildings, does allow that. So good question. I'm gonna not go too deep on that and keep focusing on this. So ducting is very, very crude to get proper airflow. 
Don't use a three inch exhaust. It just doesn't work. A lot of people recommend no matter what the duct is leaving your bath fan, upsize it a, up at a diameter. So if it comes out as a three, take it to a four. If it comes out as a four, take it to something bigger. Um, uh, and I'm just going to say, you know, uh, yeah, the way you duct uh, is crucial. Yes, go ahead. I've noticed on those bath fans, I mean, if you look at the CFM that it, that it states on the bath fan, well, then you go look at the manufacturer's installation instructions, and that's based on a four-inch smooth hard metal duct. You know, it's not based yeah, on a three-inch straight. flex duct. Right, running straight for 15 feet. Yep, that's it. And when you put a terminal device and yeah, all kinds of stuff. So I just have a little diagram here saying if you're ducting it and you're going to use elbows, you know, try to use, oh, here we go again. Um, I, I can try a different um, internet setting if, if, if you lose me. But anyway, if you can do 245s here as opposed to 290s, that's a lot less pressure drop, that kind of thing. So another way of doing this is you can duct outside air into the return. It has to be a ducted return for it to work. And we, we see a motorized damper and some sort of maybe a balancing damper, but a motorized damper and a controller that's gonna make this system work. So this is very famous. This system sometimes goes by the name Central Fan Integrated Supply. I hate that name, it just doesn't roll off the tongue. I, I call it outside air or fresh air into the return. Um, and, and the idea is, here's a, try to ignore all the other stuff going on in this picture. You've got a mechanical system that has got return ducts and supply ducts. And what we're talking about adding is, you know, typically like a six inch, maybe an eight inch um, outside air duct. And you want to introduce it pretty close to the blower. The closer you get it to the blower, the more static pressure, the more air you're going to be able to pull. Um, and, it, and it's, like I said, got a motorized damper in it and a controller. And when it's open and operating, you're gonna pull most of the air from the house, but you're also gonna pull some fresh air. You're gonna filter it, you're gonna heat it or cool it, you're gonna distribute it throughout the house. And so you get really good distribution. And, um, and, and that, that's a, a, it's an effective way of providing fresh air. So you need a motorized damper and control. So on the plus side, you know, I think all the stuff I've mentioned, I like a little bit of positive pressure on where the air comes from. Uh, a lot of good, things. there's really only one negative. The big negative is that you're using a giant fan, which may be pulling, let's say three, 400 watts to basically move 50 CFM. So it's, 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 it's a big energy penalty. If you do a HERS rating, you take a big hit with using a monster fan like that. Um, the, the goal though, is that the controller is going to make sure that you get fresh air only when you want it. And so let's say you set up the, the fresh air and you want to run 15 minutes of fresh air every hour. If it's a really cold night or a hot day, um, chances are the air handlers run. And so all it does is it piggybacks on the runtime of the air handler. So for 15 minutes of that runtime, it's just going to open the damper and bring in fresh air. And then after 15 minutes, it shuts off. So it's not really adding, it's adding a little bit of load, of course, there's no free lunch on fresh air, but it's not, it's, it, your, your fan was already running. So you're, you're just piggybacking on what was happening. Um, and so it, but it also prevents you from overventilating. If you just had a, had a balance, a, a swing damper here, anytime this thing ran, you would provide fresh air, but it would probably overventilate and overventilate on the worst time, the hottest and coldest days. So it's a good idea. You, or you want to have the controller and the motorized damper. And also if it's a mild day, like I don't know if it's like today, but it's, it's a really beautiful day. We've had a gorgeous spring in Atlanta. So it's about, you know, 70 degrees outside. Our thermostats aren't calling for any heating or cooling. Well, after 45 minutes goes by, the controller says, Hey, it's time to bring in fresh air. Open up the damper, bring, uh, uh, run the blower for 15 minutes, mix the air in the house, and then shut off. So it keeps you from overventilating and underventilating. It's pretty inexpensive to do this. You can retrofit it. It's got a lot of good benefits. By code today, if you're going to use your big blower as part of your ventilation system, it has to be an ECM motor. And today, pretty much every furnace today is uh, ECM, but not necessarily every heat pump. So just be aware of that. And, and, and it does say if it's another fan, it has to meet a certain efficiency. Um, 
Here's another strategy for supply only, which um, this was invented by a buddy of mine in Dallas. Um, and uh, um, now there's at least three or four companies that have this uh, additionally. Um, the first one that come out was uh, QFresh. And the idea here is it's just a really efficient bath fan running backward. So it pulls in fresh air, it can filter it, and it supplies that air into the house. You can use the ducts or you can run it independently. Um, it, it's, it's pretty low cost and it's got, here's the key thing, it's very efficient. I can move 50 CFM for 13 watts. That's about the energy of an LED light bulb. That's pretty impressive. Um, it also has, this is the key thing, uh, a temperature and moisture sensor. In it. So it's designed to run continuously, to always bring in fresh air, unless the outside conditions are, I'm gonna use air quotes here, bad. So if the outside condition is bad and you get to define what bad is, it's gonna intentionally underventilate. And there's different ways they do this. Some of them cycle off for a little bit and then run a little bit and retest. Some of them throttle, but anyway, the idea is when it's bad, and bad, you might set bad to be it's above 90 degrees, or it's below 40 degrees, or it's above a certain humidity or below a certain humidity. It's just the idea of using sensors to make adjustments on ventilation. I think it's a great concept. I think you're going to see more and more of this idea in the future. You might also be looking at outdoor pollutants, for example. So this is a great concept. Um, I'm so glad downsides. you brought that up, Mike. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but just Go I ahead. think that the important thing here for you, for folks on the webinar this morning, it's a smart ventilation strategy. In Houston, when it's 94 degrees with 90% relative humidity, I'm sorry, I don't want to be bringing in 75 CFM. Of, and, and shout out to my, my buddy, Tom Morell, who invented or the, the founder of QFresh for it. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just, it's that for the cost of this unit and, and when you factor in all that it does, it's just the absolute no brain solution in my, in my it, opinion. It, it's, it's a really good, um, it's a really good, I'm going to say, you know, pretty reasonable cost uh, ventilation strategy that overcomes some of the issues. But I do want to be clear with everybody that it does not do any kind of energy recovery and it does not do any kind of dehumidification. So you, you, you do need to be aware of that. It, it is what it is, and we'll talk more about the perfect ventilation system later, but I'm a big advocate of it. I think it can work very well, um, and, it, and it has definite advantages to me over some of the other low-cost strategies. So thank you for that. I also want to make a pitch for there are hybrid approaches where we've got a controller that looked at the run time, it's, it's basically going to use central fan idea and a bath fan. And let me try to give you an example. So, you know, if you had an ERV or something that was running continuous, and let's say you're running 30 CFM all the time for an hour, there's a certain amount of fresh air that your volume of air you provide. But let's say your mechanical system was running for 15 minutes on its own, and you had a controller that opened the damper got your 15 minutes of fresh air. It, it, it wasn't enough uh, to satisfy the total need. Let's say the total need was 1,800 in an hour. But um, the, the little controller was, nothing's happening, nothing's happening, nothing's happening, nothing's happening. I get that last hour. Hey, you know what? I'm going to make the difference because it's doing the calculation of how much it needs. And it knows your bath fan whoops, can run 60 CFM. But it'll make up the difference by running your bath fan the differential amount. So I think this is a, a viable strategy. It's a clever idea. Um, AirCycler has this capability. There's also, uh, I think it's called Air Controls. It's something really generic. They have um, a, a product that will also look at your kitchen hood and your clothes dryer and your bath fans. And they, they will basically say, we're, we're monitoring how much these other appliances run and then the ventilation system will make up the difference. So there's some clever ideas that fall into the realm of hybrids. The, uh, the, the next category um, is, and most people probably have heard of what an ERV does. It basically takes, you know, your stale air from indoors to outside, it air from outdoors, it brings it inside. 
but it, it, it doesn't mix the two air streams. It does use the energy of the stale air to precondition the fresh air. So they go through a core, a heat exchanger, hopefully you can still hear me, and the uh, heat and moisture, because it's an ERV, can transfer both heat and moisture. Heat and moisture uh, from the fresh air is picked up and dumped into the stale air. So this will remove, I would say on average, about half of the moisture from the outside air. Um, there is still going to be a moisture load that is introduced into the house. Um, but uh, ERVs, I will say today, work really well in the winter. They do a terrific job with sensible heat, which is the temperature cooling. Um, they do a so-so job with moisture. They are, uh, there's real cool research they're working on cores that are much more efficient at moisture transfer. So we might start seeing ERVs in the future that have a much better uh, capability of removing the, the moisture. So this is a technology. Um, and uh, again, the big difference with HRV, nobody on this call needs to worry about that. We want ERVs that can do heat moisture. Here it is conceptually. Um, if it is cold outside, your cold air is essentially heated up and introduced by the energy of the air leaving. But in our climate, it's typically hot outside and humid maybe. And so that heat and moisture is picked up and dumped outside, whereas the, the fresh air continues inside. Um, there's also some really low cost entry level versions of this. For about the same price as that, um, the QFresh, you can buy, I, I call it a toy ERV, Panasonic makes it. It's um, only about 40 CFM, and that's on a, you know, on a good day downhill with a tailwind. But it, it's easy to install. It's only got two ducts that you connect. So it pulls the air from the house and exhausts it, and it brings in fresh air and introduces that air into the same space. So usually you put this wherever your return duct is located. But it is a way to get into the ERV sort of you know, world without a lot of money down. So. Um, it, it's an option. It, do, it, it really does not do well on latent though, so it's much better on sensible. Um, a bigger ERV, I just thought I'd show you all a picture. This is one I put in my own crawl space, and um, it's a 70 CFM ERV. Uh, that's more than I need for my house, but no, it, it, I'll, I'll tell you about how I do it. Um, it's definitely more expensive to install. Um, you got four ducts that you're talking about. And I am a big advocate of, you can tie an ERV into one side uh, or the other of the duct system, but don't try to uh, put your supply into the return and your return from the supply. All that'll happen is you'll bypass your air handler. So you don't, you won't want to do that unless your blower was running all the time, which is not good. So um, I, I'm gonna say I am an advocate of independently ducting an ERV. Um, and so that's pretty much what I did in my house. So there it is hanging. I hung it from the crawl space. My uh, crawl space is a conditioned crawl space. I retrofitted that. That was a webinar we did last week. Um, and it looks a lot like this diagram right here where I chose to um, have one fresh air inlet and one stale exhaust to the outdoors. Uh, but I'm pulling from two different rooms and I'm supplying into two different rooms. So. That's kind of what, that's not what I did, but that's, uh, and that's a, a picture I had that sort of shows what I made. So I used um, an old crawl space vent. Of course, these were closed up because it's a condition crawl. And that's my fresh air intake. And it was a, it's in a good spot. It's, it's not near anything that, that, you know, someone's gonna park a car next to it or put a trash can next to it. That's my exhaust. It just dumps out near my condensing unit. Um, here is one of the places I pulled air from. Uh, the, I just put a little hole in my floor and put a little vent, a louver on it. Here's one of my um, supplies. Um, I, that one came up through a closet and then blows out through the little sidewall here. Uh, sorry, those are both supplies, my bad. These are both supplies. Um, they're putting uh, into two different bedrooms. The other side of our house, the living room and the kitchen is, that's much more likely to open to doors opening and that fresh air if you can or you want to more on the the bedrooms in the house and then the um exhaust uh, one i came through i have a fern uh one of my rooms has a and it actually is just the four inch pipe extends up just below that grill right there and then the other one i actually 
like to pull um, fresh air, excuse me, stale air from a closet. And, um, you know, I, some people try to pull it from bathrooms. I like the bath fan to do its job on its own. This is my philosophy and others too. Um, I, the ERV, if you, if you think about it, if you pull air from the bathroom, you're taking moist, humid air from a shower and you're going to basically just dump it back into the house. Um, through the core. So I, I kind of like to not pull from a bathroom, uh, you know, a shower room intentionally. Um, and uh, so that's a, a little in, in the floor. And then I, I just put a little cage over it so no one would block it. And it's in the closet. And the closet has got two doors and they've got a good one inch undercut. So I, I feel like I'm getting decent airflow. I know I'm getting decent airflow. I measured it. I'm getting, uh, it's supposed to be 70. I was getting 87 CFM. So it's good ducting makes all the difference in the world. And also I put a controller so I can run it on um, either a, a high, a low. High is about, you know, 85, 87 CFM. Low, low is probably about 40. And um, intermittent low is 20 minutes on low, 40 minutes off every hour. So depending on the season or whether there's a giant pandemic, I uh, affect the amount of runtime. And uh, that's, that's my take on that. So um, uh, I'm going to try to see if I can't wrap up. And uh, probably the biggest thing just to be aware of is we're seeing more and more need for moisture control. Uh, many splits can help on that, but supplemental dehumidification might be something we need to consider. ERVs in general have become much more affordable. They are still more expensive and probably, probably on the highest end. Um, and of course, variable speed. And I love the smart controllers. So I'm going to jump on ahead and let me just work a, a, a Houston in the morning example. <laughs> this is really Atlanta in the morning, but this might be Houston on a day where it's not that hot. It's only 82 degrees, and, um, but it's real humid. It's 80% relative humidity. And, and I know, Jason, you gave an example what's even worse. But if you uh, know anything about the psychrometric chart, if you look at that, that's got about 130 grains of moisture in it. And it's a dew point of 75 degrees. So that's really humid air. And if you just dump that into the building without conditioning it, you know, that's quite, quite feasible that you could have some condensation issue. Any, a, a cubic foot of that air basically that comes in contact with a surface below 75 degrees is gonna condense. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip the rest of this and, and just say, um, the other interesting thing, now, it, it's, it's definitely hotter out in Texas, but, but we have a lot more hours of the summer in Atlanta where it's, it's not actually that hot. It's below 85 degrees for about, you know, the, the vast majority of the hours of the summer. And not that often is it actually above, you know, say, 90 degrees. And we design our temperature, our air conditioner system for the, quote, almost hottest days of the year. But most of the summer, it's actually it's actually way down in there. So we really want to pay attention to moisture. And as a result of that, I would argue that for Houston, for many climates, arguably the best ventilation system is, and it's definitely more expensive, is a ventilating dehumidifier. And the way it works is it pulls in fresh air. It also pulls in house air. It filters it, really good filter. It mixes it, and then it dries it as needed. And it introduces this now much drier air back into the house. And I think if, if you got clients with money or moisture or health concerns, this is, this is the way to go. You know, I said money because that's probably part of this too. It is more expensive, but I, this is arguably one of the best approaches. So, and then supplemental. Okay, so um, just let me summarize this and then we'll see if we have time for questions or, or answer any questions. But um, it, the best ventilation system to me doesn't exist yet. Okay, we're, we're Frankensteining a system. We're going to pull ideas from different products there. What it probably could of is, like you said, you like this control base, so do I. Um, it's got a, I, I like uh, the energy recovery aspect of it because, you know, you bring in fresh air, you got to bring, you got to exhaust uh, air as well. Let's capture some of that energy. And I definitely like the supplemental dehumidification. So what am I, and, and, a, and a good filter. What am I looking for? You know, I'm looking for an ERV with a dehumidifier with these smart sensor controls, a nice filter. And I'm, you know, I, the said, I'm willing to pay $14 for this unit. And it's got to cost no more than 28 cents a month to operate. 
and I want it to be really easy to prove it works and, and you know, that it, it, it's going to send me a text if it needs some kind of maintenance issue. So it doesn't exist yet. But I do think you're going to see the industry moving towards this kind of stuff. And hopefully now you have a good sense of what are the features of it. Um, the last thing I have, how are we doing on time? We're, we're getting there. Any questions that we want to answer at this point? Because I might show you a little bit of research. Go yeah, ahead. I do have a few questions that came in. And then I ha do have a, a couple of people that have raised their hand. I, we, we typically don't unmute people. If you will type your question either in the Q&A bar or in the chat bar, we can answer it that way. I do have a couple yeah. that uh, have come in if you want to do the questions real quick. How do you determine flow rate from the fresh air intake? How do you measure it? Is that yeah. the question? Yeah. Um, uh, do I have a picture of it? There's a pretty inexpensive device. Um, I mean, you can certainly use a flow hood. And um, if it's an intake, um, there's actually a fairly inexpensive device. It, it's really, you can actually build your own. It's a cardboard box with a known square inches of opening. And you got to do the math and calculate it. If and you need a pressure gauge. Um, and typically, if you have a blower door or a duct tester, duct blaster, you're going to have a pressure gauge that can do this. Um, Energy Conservatory actually sells this device, and I, I think they call it the exhaust fan flow hood. And it's not that expensive, but you can literally make your own. Um, and what you're trying to do is it's it's a cardboard box with a known hole cut into it, known size, and you put a pressure tap in it, so you're measuring the pressure in that, and you cover up the intake. And um, as the air flows across it, based on the pressure drop across the, um, what's inside the box and what's out in the ambient where you're standing, you can actually calculate the CFM. It's, it's reasonably accurate, and um, it really does work. It only works for exhaust, though. So your air has to be coming through the box. You can't you can't put it on a supply register, um, and and uh, that's that's a great way to verify and and improve the ventilation system works. Uh, any other questions before I or um, at this point? I think we're caught up on questions. Good. All right. Let me show you. I thought you might get a kick out of this. We did some research in a Houston light climate. Um, this was some Building America research. Southface was involved in with. Um, uh, production builders, and I'm gonna to try to cut to the chase on this, um, but looking at using ERVs with some smart control capabilities, and uh, I'm trying to cut, get through the big stuff here. Um, understanding, let's see, so the basic idea here was we had four homes, they're all in the same neighborhood, they're all pretty consistent, they're all Energy Star, and um, we basically were monitoring comfort as well as a bunch of, with surveys, but as well as actually a bunch of measurements like temperature and relative humidity. We measured pollutants and we measured energy and we switched uh, every other week, every other week or every week, uh, we switched between operating the ERV continuously or operating it with um, some smart controls looking at uh, the outside air. And I wanna show you this. So our smart mode, uh, when it was in smart mode, it basically said, Temperature and relative humidity outside is not ideal. And so we're going to basically uh, shut off for 50 minutes out of the hour. And then we're going to run for 10 and retest. So you're still getting some ventilation no matter what, but you're intentionally underventilating when the outdoor conditions are, let's say, not ideal. And um, some examples, these are all homes in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. So they happen to be on stilts. So they really are, you know, uh, 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 like a pier foundation. Um, and they're all pretty close to each other. And I think they were built in a flood risk area. So that's why they're on stilts. Um, and then uh, some of the stuff we measured, you know, temperature relative humidity. Uh, PM 2.5 is particulate matter. Uh, 2.5 micron range is particularly dangerous particulates for um, human lungs. So that's a good thing to monitor. We measured CO2, which in and of itself is not a pollutant, but it is something that indicates how much fresh air is in the space. So those are some things we measure. Um, and I think that's, and we, look, we looked at radon, but you can imagine there wasn't much radon in houses on stills. So uh, basically, 
you know, <laughs> when you look at the weather data <laughs> in either continuous mode or smart mode, what we were looking at was how much of the time was the outdoor air above 60% relative humidity? And the answer is a lot of the time. Um, so 60%, anything above 60%, you're getting into kind of 70% definite mold growth, 60% some molds can grow. Um, and so that's kind of a good sort of just an indicator. And, and I like our conclusion that it's humid in Charleston, in case you didn't know that. Um, so we could do the same research in Houston if needed. Uh, then we looked at what happened to indoors when we ran the two, two different modes. And again, the, 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 all the four houses would be in continuous mode, and then a week would go by and all four houses would switch to smart mode. And so um, what we found was um, some houses that didn't make a, much of a difference, some houses that definitely did make a difference. Um, so, and it was always trending in the right direction. So that was one thing you could say. Um, and then in terms of uh, seasonal, how did it look? And it was interesting because we didn't find, it, I'm gonna try to kind of conclude here. It didn't seem to really make a consistent difference in the cooling season. Um, and it did actually make more of a difference in some of the other seasons. So the reason why is basically because the air conditioners in the houses were able to handle the latent load always under either, under either um, run mode. So basically because the air conditioner could keep up, we didn't see that, that you know, but, but we, we, did, we will see in terms of run time that it was a benefit. So I'll show you that in a second. Um, basically the good news is this might actually be more applicable to other climates as opposed to just hot humid. It actually looks like it could work pretty well for a mixed humid and maybe a marine climate. Um, uh, that's, that's just kind of, we measure everything. The indoor, the, the cut to the chase is that good indoor air quality was maintained in either run mode. And interestingly enough, in some cases, um, smart mode actually helped with things like, um, uh, which one was I going to show? Uh, CO2. Um, actually, we found a higher C, is that right? Uh, one of them. Anyway, the, the, the real takeaway here is that uh, we, we found consistent uh, air quality maintained in the run. So that's obviously good. Uh, and our models were also good. Um, we predicted a certain amount of energy saving, about 12% energy savings of runtime on the ERV. And that's really what we got. So very good. And that amounted to about a, a little over 100 kilowatt hours a year of savings from not operating the ERV continuously. So, you know, that's, that's okay, that's good. And then the other big savings was the less load on the air conditioner. Uh, and so the, the typical load reduction was, you know, close to 300 uh, kilowatt hours on less air conditioning runtime. So the total was close to 400 kilowatt hours a year of savings just by the smart mode operation. So here we, we were able to demonstrate, you know, essentially that you can still maintain good indoor air quality and you can still maintain indoor moisture in either case because the, the air conditioner was handling the load, the latent. But we were also able to see, you know, about 400 kilowatt hours a year of, of energy savings. And, you know, it's probably 50 bucks of electricity, of, you know, maybe a little bit more out in Texas, but it's in that ballpark. Um, so, okay, that was, uh, you just, I hope you feel like, you drank from the ventilation fire hydrant and you, you took a, a deep, a deep swallow there. I covered a lot in a, in a, an hour's time, but um, hopefully you found that interesting. I will share all these slides with Jason um, and I'm happy to answer if anybody has any other questions. And, and, and in addition to the slides uh, for everyone on the webinar today, you'll get a follow up course evaluation from Liz, uh, fill out the course evaluation and you go get ICCC use fantastic presentation, by the way, today, Mike, and then also on the original invitation, there was a hyperlink to South Face's additional webinars coming up. I know me personally, I got a little excited when I heard you say insulated high performance roof line. I might be a bit yeah. of a nerd. Yeah. I don't know what my problem is, but it did add some excitement to my life. That's I will go ahead and have Liz send that hyperlink back out with the course evaluation. So you'll have it in a couple of places. Um, I have a feeling South Face has some other really good webinars coming up. So you folks hop on and participate in their webinars. 
Uh, thanks so much, Mike. I mean, that, that was fantastic. I always, I, I do, when I do my energy code presentation, I go on a bit of a rant on the whole ventilation section in the code, just because there's, it, it, we've got a long way to go. We're on our, we're on our infancy for getting this yeah, right. Yeah. And production builders, frankly, just aren't, Granite is a whole lot more uh, appealing to a typical homeowner than, oh, what is my fresh air ventilation rate and blower door measurement, you know, and, and, and just th these are some things that we have to further educate uh, consumers about and, and really, you know, w when I was a building official and, and we went from the 06 to the 12 energy code, which required a house tight enough such that you had to blower door test and you get below that five ACH 50, so whole house mechanical ventilation, fresh air re is required. And, and, you know, I was just begging my builders, have a conversation with your homeowner because they'd put that little Honeywell yeah, okay. controller on the, uh, uh, some, most of my builders in the jurisdiction where I was building official opted for that controller, ducted into the return plenum, but yep, then they would yep. never have a conversation. The homeowner didn't even know it was installed. I'd go up there on the CO yep. inspection, you know, there's three dials on that controller, CFM, square footage, number of bedrooms, of course, all three of those are turned all the way down, which would be <laughs> fine for my wife and I, who are in and out all day, open the windows all the time, don't cook much at home, don't have pets, but the little old couple with nine cats and three dogs that fry three meals a day and never open a window or open a door, that yeah, thing needs to yeah. be run in all the time, and, and that's kind of why, it's, in my opinion, it's it's just de facto broken in the code because it, because it's so based on occupant behavior, which you can't write a code for it. And really, I mean, I, I would see, be curious if you agree with this, uh, Mike. I, I think 15 years from now, the only way to get this right is it's going to have to be tied to your indoor air quality monitors, which will, that are also monitoring the outdoor air. I mean, and, and it's, it will be a ventilation controlled, smart ventilation monitored system is really the only yeah, way. I, I, yeah, I, I think uh, I like that. I like your, your approach. And um, yes, I definitely see uh, that is the wave of the future. I put my email out there too. It's Mike B at southface.org. If y'all have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, I'm not in the office today or Monday, but um, feel free to send me a message if you got any questions. But I, I think, um, I think you're right. And th that's why I kind of had that. What's the ideal ventilation system? because it doesn't quite exist yet, you know, and, um, but it has, it has elements of stuff that does exist. I'm trying to find my little summary slide. It has elements of all the stuff that we've talked about. And I think that if you can uh, uh, sort of see what it's trying to do and why it's trying to do, and you're right, the code, the code has approached this in a weird way that, you know, we've always focused on energy, 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 and now in, in more recent versions of the code, we're trying to finally, sort of connect the dots with people about how the high performance homes that we want have have tight envelopes and they have fresh air and maybe some of the ways people do fresh air i'm trying to beat up the ash folks because I, i'm like you know we got this great climate zone map not all ventilation strategies are created equal you know if you're in a humid climate why don't you just say don't use the house negative pressure but right. you know we're working on it well so it's an evolving thing Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say it's it's an ever evolving conversation. It's it, and I have a slide on this in the other one that I went past, but it kind of says we all agree that it's a good thing. We don't all agree on how much are the best ways to do it. And and I I like your comment that we've got you know I I if you read that white paper I talked about you know what I want is I want a traffic light. I want an IAQ traffic light that's in your house that is exactly what you said. It's looking a bunch of pollutants and it's and it's gonna, you know, hopefully normally everything's on green, but if something's in the, you know, danger zone, it's gonna alert me, or, or not the danger, you know, the, the caution zone is gonna alert me. And if something spikes, like say coxa, then it's gonna, you know, it's gonna alarm me, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, I think all of those are, uh, I, I think the wave of the future, but I, I see it coming and, and we've got a lot more um, affordable, you know, purple air, food kind of uh, indoor air quality sensors that are now on the market. And I don't have one yet. I'm kind of waiting and checking on them, but they're, but, but we've been involved in some research that is kind of evaluating them. So, um, so look for that. A lot of good stuff coming on this front. 
I'm, I'll be excited to follow it. And uh, I, mean, I had several people chat in and talk about, yeah, I have a feeling your next webinar is going to have a few extra folks from Texas and Oklahoma because- uh, We love it. Lots we of lots people of from all over. So <laughs> we, we try to offend equally. So uh, no, there it's, it's, it's uh, no, they've been a lot of fun. And I believe if any of the, I'm, I'm positive they've all been recorded and you can, you can view or listen to them all for free. Um, and so, uh, you know, go, uh, also I think South Face is getting a brand new website overhaul today. So I don't, I don't know what our website looks today compared to Monday, but, uh, or Tuesday, but, just um, be aware of that. But please um, use us as a resource. And uh, thank you so much. And, and uh, really appreciate y'all's time. And Jason, thanks again for the invite. Thanks so much. Everyone have a fantastic weekend. Stay safe out there, everybody. Thanks again, Mike. Talk to you All later. Right. Thanks again.